Ridley Scott's new epic war film Napoleon, starring Joaquin Phoenix as Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, has been released to theatres but has received much criticism over its seemingly loose portrayal of historical events. We're not a movie review channel, so we're not going to rate the movie in terms of its cinematic value. Although we want more historical movies made as they help popularize our field, it is also essential to provide additional background to allow the viewers to learn what really happened in history. In Ridley Scott's biopic, many historical facts regarding the French Emperor's 22-year military career have seemingly been left on the wayside, or omitted entirely in favor of spectacle or to simplify the narrative. In this video, we will be examining and reviewing several of the most significant historical inaccuracies or omissions in Ridley Scott's Napoleon. This video was sponsored by our kind YouTube members and patrons. Becoming a YouTube member or patron is the best way to support our work, so we're now providing our supporters with exclusive videos to thank them. Join their ranks to watch the Pacific War series, alongside the First Punic War, Sulla's biography, the Italian War of Unification, Risorgimento, the Russo-Japanese War, Albigensian Crusade, History of Prussia, and much more. 80 or so exclusive videos in total. In 2024, YouTube members and patrons will watch series on the Fall of Sparta, the Reconquista, Second Punic War, Spanish War of Succession, and Russian Civil War, and will continue getting early access to all videos, access to an exclusive Discord server, will know our schedule, and vote on future videos. YouTube member and patron support allows us to keep the majority of our videos free in a world where YouTube monetization income is very uneven. If you want to support our work, join their ranks today via the link in the description and pinned comment. Thank you! The film Napoleon struggles to truly capture the military genius and awe-inspiring charisma that has come to embody Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte in history's list of great men. Besides the opening battle sequence for the Siege of Toulon, very little time is spent on screen delving into the strategies, tactics or planning of Napoleon's battles. Instead, the battle scenes jump straight into the action, with little background context behind the sequence. A missed opportunity to demonstrate Napoleon's tactical and strategic brilliance in battles like Austerlitz. Because of this, a casual moviegoer with little or no knowledge of the Napoleonic Wars may find that the film's battle scenes, with the exception of Toulon, seem rushed or confusing. Many viewers have noted that the Napoleon theatrical cut's pacing seems very rushed, or at the very least heavily edited. Ridley Scott had previously announced that he had filmed a four-hour long director's cut of the film. But due to runtime constraints, the theatrical release had to be trimmed down to 2 hours and 38 minutes. Even at a 2.5 hour long runtime, the movie's theatrical pacing can be disorienting, jumping quickly from one scene to the next, with some scenes taking place years after the previous sequence. The only way the film seems to remind the audience that the movie has progressed by several years is through title cards displaying the name of the current scene's depicted event and the date it occurred. In the opening scene of the movie, Napoleon Bonaparte is shown as being present amongst the jeering French crowd during the execution of Queen Marie Antoinette on October 16, 1793. Napoleon was not present at the execution of the Queen, as the date she was guillotined made it physically impossible for him to be there. Earlier in the summer, Captain Napoleon had been appointed to command of the French artillery at the Siege of Toulon, and he arrived with the army operating there in early September. He remained at the siege until its conclusion in December of that year. After a scene depicting a mostly accurate 13 Vendémiaire, in which Napoleon put down a royalist revolt in Paris on October 5, 1795, the film's next major war sequence cuts to three years later, to Napoleon's Egyptian campaign. The short action sequence portraying the famous Battle of the Pyramids between Napoleon's army and the Mamluks is mostly fictionalized, shown as being fought directly underneath the Great Pyramids. In historical reality, the battle was fought at a relative distance from these ancient wonders, which really served only as a backdrop to the battlefield. In the scene, Napoleon's artillery batteries are depicted defacing the Great Pyramids with a huge cannon barrage, another Hollywood exaggeration for dramatic effect. The film also depicts Napoleon as abandoning his troops in Egypt and returning to France for the sole reason that he discovers his wife is having an adulterous affair, rather than providing any of the strategic military situations surrounding his flight from Egypt. 
One pivotal event that seems to have failed to make the final theatrical cut of Scott's film is the Battle of Marengo, a crucial battle in Napoleon's rise to power, fought during his second Italian campaign in 1800, while he was still first consul of France. This was the all-important battle that solidified Napoleon's position as first consul and maintained the security of his regime, allowing him to continue to rule France with dictatorial powers. Instead, after a few scenes showing Napoleon's tenure as first consul and a suggestion that he became a king, the film cut straight to his coronation as emperor in 1804. However, it very well may be that Scott's director's cut will feature this battle, as the film's credits feature a list of all of Napoleon's battles shown in the film, and Marengo is on this list. The scene depicting Napoleon's coronation as emperor of the French on December 2nd, 1804, is also dramatized for effect in the movie. As is shown in the film, Napoleon did indeed take the coronation crown and place it atop his own head, rather than be crowned by the Pope. However, the film makes this appear as though this act was something committed by the Emperor right at that moment, with him snatching the crown to the shock of the crowd with this bold act. Historians agree that in actuality, Napoleon had always planned to crown himself in the coronation ceremony, and it would have been no great surprise to the crowd. Instead, the story where he grabbed the crown from the Pope is usually attributed to a tale spun by coalition propagandists to vilify Napoleon further and refute his legitimacy as an emperor. The 1805 Battle of Austerlitz in Scott's Napoleon is stretched and exaggerated for dramatic effect. As previously stated, in the film there is no mention or discussion of the tactics or strategies behind what is often considered to be Napoleon's greatest battlefield masterpiece, and usually considered one of the most significant tactical victories in modern history, still studied and examined at military academies to this day. Instead, in the movie, the Battle of Austerlitz kicks off in the flurry of a furious snowstorm. In actuality, the battle was fought on a cold yet bright sunny day, with a dense fog hanging over the battlefield rather than a windy snowfall at what seems to be a time closer to darkness. The Austerlitz depicted in the movie shows the main French line situated around a medium-sized encampment in the middle of an open field, while Napoleon maintains a hidden force of infantry, cavalry and artillery in reserve within the woods behind the camp. He waits until the coalition troops are on the high ground, but without any specific mention as to why he wants them in that position. The Austro-Russian army then marches straight at the French encampment and assaults it before Napoleon unveils his hidden forces and attacks the coalition troops from the flank. Then, in an overly spectacular action sequence, the Austro-Russian troops are shown chaotically running pell-mell in full retreat through the unnamed frozen Sachchan ponds, after which French artillery fires cannonballs into the ice, sending hundreds to a freezing, watery grave. This is a stretched portrayal of a historical event. While yes, French artillery did fire shells at retreating coalition forces running through the frozen Sachchan ponds, they only managed to kill around 200 fleeing troops on the ice. The throngs of drowning soldiers shown sinking into the dark abyss in the film seems to go off contemporary Napoleonic propaganda, which had portrayed this actual event as a massacre of thousands rather than around 200. Another significant historical inaccuracy of the film's depiction of Austerlitz is the relatively contained area of space around which the battlefield is shown on screen. In reality, the Battle of Austerlitz was a wide-spanning battlefield stretching across numerous towns, hills and ridges. After the Battle of Austerlitz sequence, the film skipped the conclusion of the War of the Third Coalition and soon jumped to Napoleon's peace with Tsar Alexander I of Russia in the Treaty of Tilsit in July 1807 nearly two years after Austerlitz. This completely omits the history behind the War of the Fourth Coalition, of which the Treaty of Tilsit is a part, and Napoleon's great victory over the Prussian army at the Battle of Jena Alstedt in 1806, the bloody Battle of Eilau, a real Napoleonic battle fought in a snowstorm, and the Battle of Friedland during which Napoleon decisively defeated the combined armies of Russia and Prussia, ultimately leading to the peace at Tilsit. Following Tilsit, there is absolutely no mention of Napoleon's invasion of Spain or Portugal, or the Peninsular War, one of the greatest blunders of his reign, which opened a second front in the Iberian Peninsula that would bog down his armies and drain France of vast amounts of money, manpower and resources from 1808 to 1814. 
Perhaps the best way to have inserted this information into the movie, without compromising the film's runtime, would have been through a letter between Napoleon and Josephine narrating his thoughts on these campaigns and the situation in Spain. A similar method was used in the film for tackling Napoleon's first Italian campaign without an on-screen appearance. The next significant jump in Napoleon's timeline brings us to the infamous French invasion of Russia in the summer of 1812. The sequence culminates in the Battle of Borodino in September of that year, but the scene is highly dramatized. In reality, the bloodiest battle of the Napoleonic Wars was fought mostly over entrenched Russian positions and earthworks, with attempted flanking maneuvers and costly frontal assaults racking up high casualties for both sides. Instead, the audience is given a visually pleasing scene of a grand charge, where the French and Russian armies run towards each other, smashing together in a grand brawl, with the French cavalry charge being led in person by Napoleon, who, in historical actuality, was watching the battle unfold from behind the lines at his headquarters tent. One crucial missed opportunity of Napoleon's theatrical cut is that it fails to depict any of Napoleon's marshals or subordinate generals properly. During the Egyptian campaign sequence, they show Napoleon's invaluable chief of staff, Marshal Louis Alexandre Berthier, but besides this brief scene, his generals are relegated to the role of simply standing in the background during battle scenes. The only other exception to this is Marshal Michel Ney, shown in the Battle of Waterloo scene, where he goes unnamed in the entire sequence. After the Battle of Borodino, Napoleon enters Moscow but finds it abandoned. The scenes where Napoleon finds Moscow abandoned and later burned by the Russians are represented in a historically accurate form. When Napoleon is told their best option is to retreat back towards the Polish border, the scene switches to the infamous Great Retreat through the deadly Russian winter. The Great Retreat is given a proper historical portrayal, depicting the hardships faced by the French soldiers during the retreat, including shots of starved and half-frozen Frenchmen eating their horses, and the discovery of French stragglers and deserters being brutally killed by Cossacks raiding their lines. The Great Retreat from Moscow ends with an explanation that just 40,000 of Napoleon's original 600,000 men remain, and then immediately fast forwards two years later to Napoleon's abdication at Fontainebleau Palace in April 1814. The movie completely leaves out the German campaign of 1813, in which Napoleon suffered another disastrous defeat at the Battle of Leipzig the largest battle of the entire Napoleonic Wars, which ultimately led to the loss of the French Empire's German holdings. The movie also fails to mention Napoleon's strategically brilliant final campaign of maneuver warfare in the winter of 1813-1814, when he defended northern France from a combined coalition invasion, and merely skips right to his abdication and exile on Elba Island in the Mediterranean. Although it would have been difficult to squeeze all this into the theatrical cut's limited runtime, it could have been made possible through either a brief montage or even another narrated letter between Napoleon and Josephine. Once again, Napoleon's love connection to Josephine de Beauharnais is used as the primary reasoning behind Napoleon's motivation for escaping his exile in Elba after the film depicts him learning through a newspaper that she shared a dance with Tsar Alexander. Once Napoleon returns to France, an all too brief explanation of the strategic situation behind the 1815 Waterloo campaign is provided before jumping straight into the famous Battle of Waterloo on June 18, 1815. The Battle of Waterloo is perhaps the weakest scene of Scott's Napoleon film regarding historical accuracy and portrayal, even though it is the longest battle sequence in the entire film. For starters, it introduces the Duke of Wellington at the Congress of Vienna explaining why he must put down Napoleon's reign without any prior context as to who Wellington is or why he is in charge of the coalition's campaign against Napoleon. When the Battle of Waterloo scene begins, it depicts the two armies facing one another in a torrential downpour, separated only by a large open field. While historically there was a great rainstorm prior to the start of the battle, this took place the day and night before the battle rather than mere hours before the first shots were fired, as shown in the movie. Napoleon waits for the ground to dry before he can begin his attack, which is historically correct, but the scene is devoid of any further strategic context. The scene completely omits any mention of Napoleon detaching Marshal Grouchy's column of 33,000 men to pursue Field Marshal Blücher's Prussian army. This is pivotal context to simply omit, as Napoleon's army of 72,000 men would end up sorely missing Grouchy's column during the fight against Wellington. The battle also never mentions or shows that Wellington's army contained a sizable contingent of German and Dutch troops, such as the famed King's German Legion or the Nassau Battalions. 
The most apparent historical anachronism in the Waterloo battle scene in Scott's Napoleon is the depiction of both Napoleon and Wellington entrenching their armies in front of their camps. Historically, the Duke of Wellington gave explicit orders to his generals not to entrench at Waterloo, as he wanted to show Napoleon that he was willing to offer pitched battle on that field, and wanted him to attack frontally. Had Wellington actually entrenched his army, as was shown in the film, then Napoleon might have simply tried to outflank his defensive line rather than accept a frontal assault, which happens in the movie anyway. Once the Battle of Waterloo gets underway in the film, a few action scenes pass by in which artillery fire is exchanged. There is no mention of Napoleon's attempt to tackle the two fortified compounds serving as anchor strongholds on Wellington's right flank and center, Hougoumont and La Essente respectively. Once the artillery barrage is underway, Napoleon gives the order for the infantry assaults to begin, in which the French infantry mount over their earthwork entrenchments to attack Wellington's line, in a seemingly World War I reminiscent battle fashion. One of the French troops even shouts over the top as they perform this maneuver. After an intense infantry volley sequence, Marshal Ney launches his well-known cavalry charge against Wellington's line. The Duke orders his men to prepare to face cavalry, and the British Redcoats proceed to leave their entrenchments, which in the film already include anti-cavalry stakes, and form into infantry squares beyond the earthworks. Although the British Redcoats did historically form anti-cavalry squares to face Ney's charge, in the film it seems to defeat the purpose of even having anti-cavalry entrenchments merely for the sake of spectacle. Once the cavalry duel is raging around Wellington squares, the battle becomes even more ahistorical, when Napoleon himself leads the final charge of his cavalry and the old guard into the melee brawl unfolding on the field. Napoleon is depicted joining in the combat, slashing his sabre at redcoats, and even having a bullet from a British sharpshooter fly through his hat. Finally, the scene concludes with Blücher's Prussian army arriving to finish off Napoleon's exhausted French army by hitting it in the flank. Blücher's flank attack was historically a pivotal part of the battle, but the entire army did not link up with Wellington's left flank, as shown in the movie. Instead, the Prussian attack surged through the village of Pont-Saint-Noir against the right flank of Napoleon's line to the east. The film shows Napoleon, realizing he is defeated, riding off the battlefield, but not before he raises his sword in a salute to Wellington in a gesture of respect, to which Wellington nods in return. There is no historical documentation of this happening in reality. Blücher's pivotal role in Wellington's success appears downplayed in the film, but historically, even Wellington himself admitted he could not have won without Blücher's Prussians. The Battle of Waterloo sequence then concludes, after which the final scenes show Napoleon being sent to his second exile on St Helena in the South Atlantic to live out his final days, finishing out the movie. Although Hollywood is notorious for eschewing historical accuracy in favor of drama and spectacle, Ridley Scott's Napoleon is a culprit of ignoring important historical facts, not simply minor details, but critical historical information and context, and simply using sound bites of historical truth to embellish a mostly fictional story being shown on screen. Although Scott's four-hour director's cut may alleviate some of the problems addressed in this video, such as a lack of context and essential omissions from the history books, the film Napoleon seems to be a missed opportunity to present a captivating movie on a fascinating time period of history to a modern audience. In conclusion, the movie Napoleon should be viewed as what it is, historical fiction. Have you seen the movie? What did you think about it? Which other historical inaccuracies did you spot? What is your overall attitude towards historical fiction? Tell us in the comments. More videos on the Napoleonic era and possibly other pieces of historical fiction are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button so you don't miss it. Recently, we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.